Right, so welcome to 803 uh, in hybrid mode. We have never done this. So it might be a little patchy in the beginning. I hope you have some patience with me until I figure out sort of the best audio video setup to make this work. Um, we've either done in-person only or remote only in the past. It was at the peak of the plague that we had this past, uh, last time. Uh, and now we're gonna try this new thing. So let's see how that goes. Uh, all right. So the, this is a rather rare class in the computer science graduate schools. I have been keeping track of you know, similar or closely related courses offered at other places, and there aren't that many of them. Uh, if you know more related courses, I would appreciate pointers to them because I you know, find very interesting to think about how other people think about this and how they teach and present some of the same material. If you know of more, uh, please let me know. Uh, but this is a class that started some time ago uh, by uh, Jim Hermsleb and Marcelo Cataldo. Um, and the version you're in right now is much changed. This format that we're having this semester will uh, follow closely the format we had in uh, 2021 when this class was last offered. Uh, and both of these are much changed relative to the original version. Um, I, you know, don't know if for the better. Hopefully, uh, but you know, the jury's still out. Uh, it's a relatively new class still. Uh, but in any case, it's sort of a, a, a new class overall. Um, and there's just only a handful of similar courses elsewhere. I found one at University of Toronto some time ago. Uh, actually, one of our former PhD alum, uh, uh, Zhao, is teaching one uh, current uh, at U of T. Uh, kind of you know very similar. There's a version of this class called Applied Research Methods offered in the HCII, which is also super interesting. Uh, but I don't believe it's offered right now. Uh, I don't it may have been offered in the spring, uh, but but not right now. Um, there's another one at University of Victoria in Canada by Peggy Story. Uh, but really, I, I really don't know of, of courses like these uh, offered broadly. There are. Uh, on the one hand, very generic science courses. I'll come back to this in a second. Uh, but on the other hand, kind of you know, made relevant to computer science PhD students in particular. You know, uh, people in uh, uh, software engineering or cell computing programs here are a good example of that. Uh, just as an aside, there's a really interesting class at UW called Bullshit, uh, and you know, associated book and whatnot. Uh, if, so, if you ever have any free time to Kind of waste on the internet. This is a totally worthwhile thing to to you know get into. I've actually uh, adapted some of their materials for later in the semester. Uh, it's just really fascinating how it present this. It's very accessible and, and engaging and exciting. So I encourage you to check out the book uh, and class. One other point of order. I don't know if I can see the Zoom chat, so please just interrupt me. Some comment. I might not get to it because I don't have the Zoom thing. Uh, Zoom chat open in front of me. Um, so, you know, just please interrupt me at any point for anything. I will not be offended at all. Um, this is a very informal experience, hopefully. Um, all right. So, for today, what I'd like to do is give you an overview of the topic and a little bit of, you know, background and logistics about the class to, you know, hopefully convince you to stay in it. Uh, for the remainder of the semester, and I'm not scare you away. I guess we'll see who comes back on Thursday. Um, and hear a little bit about your uh, research interests and passions and things like that, things that drive you to this class so that I can hopefully make it even more relevant uh, to your own work than it might have already been by accident. Uh, okay. So, you know, let's see if anybody here in the room or the Zoom uh, so recognizes themselves in, in these descriptions. So is it that, you know, as part of your research, you're trying to understand how some practitioners, you know, be it software engineers or designers or, you know, whatever they might be, um, how they work and what challenges they face and things like this. You know, is this something that has happened as part of your research or you anticipate happening? Is it that, you know, maybe there is sufficient uh, and knowledge about the particular uh, audience um, and some understanding of the challenges they face. You know, maybe they're struggling to work more productively. You know, who isn't, et cetera, et cetera. 
And you know, maybe you're looking to inform the design of some possible solutions to help these practitioners in your respective areas. Yeah. Maybe you've really built something, you've designed something, you've built a tool, an algorithm, a system, or something, um, and you're looking to evaluate it. You know, hopefully you want to show uh, you want that, that the thing you've built is actually useful and you know does something better than the things that existed before it and you know make somebody's lives better on in some you know tangible demonstrable way um, as opposed to it being just something you know that you personally find exciting so you know let's see is anybody so far uh recognizing themselves in you know any of these descriptions a little bit mostly most people what about the zoom call uh, third one for sure. Can I get a hand or something, a signal that you're alive? <laughs> okay, so what am I missing? I, it's still still a few things that I'm missing, it seems. I, I haven't quite, I've, I've captured things that are relevant to many of you, but not quite all of you. What am I missing? Who wants to go first? What am I missing? Let's see, Sam? Uh, sure. So, I mean, I would, obviously, like, I guess for me, this outline broadly applies to my research topic of like, we're, you know, we're, my project is Penrose. So, we're building like a tool to try to help people make diagrams, which is like a real problem that exists. And like, ideally, we will eventually want to evaluate this. Um, I think that like, maybe part of the hesitation to people is that, is that like, it feels sometimes like the, the primary, part of the work is the first part of the third bullet, but like, I guess probably part of the point of this course is to get a broader view of research and be like the, the things that come before and the evaluation like are tied to each other together and it's important to think about this stuff up front. Um, okay, yeah, thanks for the comment. How was the audio on the, on the Zoom call? Could people hear what Sam said? Yes, thanks. Yes, so, okay, so that means that I don't have to, um, I will repeat stuff that people are saying in the room or summarize stuff that people are saying in the room. Uh, if you tell me the audio was not clear enough, but I, I need that input from you on the Zoom call because otherwise I won't know. I'm happy to, to summarize and repeat stuff from the room so that you know we're all on the same page. I just need to know that it's necessary. Okay, so um, I agree with this. Um, I, I think often people put most effort into designing and building something, the system, um, and they they maybe don't think as hard about evaluating it in a objective, rigorous way, you know, to demonstrate to a wider audience that you know it, it does it solves some particular problem better than its predecessors um, for more than the people that built it and are already super excited about it. So I think I, I think I agree with this, and I think hopefully I will convince you by the end that um, it's actually worth thinking a little bit more about you know how we evaluate uh, things that we build and how we provide evidence more generally for the claims that we're trying to make in our research papers. What about on the Zoom call? What are, what things am I missing in terms of you know, activities or or? things that are part of your research plans. Um, I'll throw one out, Bogdan, uh, is for me, it's not just like an evaluation probabilistically, um, also need to understand the, the impact that I look a lot at safety. So it's not just uh, how often is a autonomous car going to run into someone? There's also like a question of uh, how uh, important is it that it's going to run into somebody? Okay, so that's a good point. Thanks, Trent. So I never said, I never, I believe I never said that the evaluation need to be numeric. Uh, there's probably lots of dimensions that are relevant here. Uh, I, I believe what I said is, you know, you have to provide some evidence for the claims that you're trying to make 
so that you can substantiate them with the empirical evidence. Um, but the claims could be of any nature. I don't think I restrict the nature of the claims you are you know, trying to make to say things that are uh, numerically testable. Okay, so uh, well, hopefully it is, you know, for most of you, uh, at least part of the reason why you're here, uh, in addition to this just being a cool class to take. Um, okay, so as part of this, you will probably find yourselves trying to uh, answer some of these questions, you know, uh, how do I collect, what data do I collect in the first place, you know, what kind of data, you know, is it qualitative, is it quantitative, and how do I go about doing this, how do I then analyze this so that I can make the claims that I'm hoping to make, um, what kinds of evidence do I need to collect to, you know, demonstrate convincingly, objectively, hopefully, uh, to an audience that some approach A is better than some other approach B. Uh, how do I then draw conclusions from this body of evidence? What constitutes sufficient evidence? You know, when do I stop? You know, how much evidence is sufficient evidence to convince uh, the audience, the readers, the reviewers, whoever, uh, that you, you know, your claims are uh, sufficiently valid. Uh, so these are the kinds of things we will be dealing with in this class. Oops. Um, right, so the central question uh, through all of this work is going to be, you know, regardless of the main reasons why you decided to do a study in the first place, you know, how do you validate the claims that you're trying to make? Um, by the way, just as an aside, um, this is probably, I don't know if you've realized this, uh, maybe you have, but this is probably the number one reason by far why papers get rejected during peer review. Um, you know, it's not that you only, uh, I don't know, um, uh, and, uh, did a qualitative analysis and the reviewers wanted a quantitative analysis or the other way around or, you know, what have you, right? Uh, it's most often, uh, I argue, feel free to you know, convince me otherwise, um, that it's because you're making claims that are not sufficiently supported by the evidence you've provided. Right. So it's not that, uh, you know, it's not that the claims are the wrong claims to make, it's that you're not offering enough evidence to support them. Right. So you can fix this in two ways, you know, you can change the claims you're making so that they match the evidence you're providing, you know, or you could provide more evidence to actually substantiate the claims you were hoping to make in the first place, you know, if that's the case. But so the reason papers get rejected is the mismatch between these two. It's not that one is wrong and the other one is right. It's just that they're out of sync. That is the problem. Okay, so the short answer, you know, you could, I guess, you know, stop here and we can call this a day. The short answer is to the question, how do you validate your claims? Is it depends. Um, so, uh, as much as I would like to offer you silver bullet that uh, you know you can then apply to all scenarios and, and be guaranteed success, I'm afraid I cannot. Um, so it's sort of a little bit more complicated than this. Uh, and so this is where this knowledge that you will be fine tuning uh, as part of this class on empirical research methods will come in handy uh, because there's a wide diversity of methods that are available. They are used uh, in, in many stages of research. They're used you know, early to understand a problem, uh, uh, you know, as early as understanding a problem that nobody has looked at before and has any idea what, you know, what it is about, uh, and as late as demonstrating the utility of a particular solution that you know, either you or somebody else has, has built, and, and anywhere in between. Um, and the other thing that I will hopefully convince you of by the end is that uh, each of these research methods, of which there are many, um, has its own standards for quality and rigor and, and excellence. Um, and it's not going to be the case any one method is always superior to all the others. Um, it will always be the case that you know, some methods are more appropriate to apply than others, given the context. Um, and even then, you know, each method, the application of each method to a particular uh, problem will have its you know, varying standards of rigor. And I'm hoping to uh, as well teach you the, the most rigorous of those as part of this class. Um, okay, yeah, so we talked about this um, 
and I guess we hinted at this, they can still be useful. All right, so how, how do we decide like, which ones do we use and, and when? Um, well, it sort of depends on lots of things. It uh, depends on your general approach to research. How do you think about research in general? It depends on the nature of the contribution you're trying to make. It depends on the specific research questions you're trying to answer. It depends on the overall state of knowledge on that particular subject and lots of other things probably. So lots of things that it depends on. Uh, and we'll see a little bit of you know, what this means uh, in a second. So here's one way to think about research approaches and research methods. Um, so here's one. So research exists across at least two uh, continua, two spectrums. Um, one is ranging from inductive to deductive in terms of research approaches. Um, if we talk about research methodologies, which are kind of one step, you know, lower level, more concrete, uh, we could talk about the spectrum from qualitative to quantitative research methods and you know, anything in between uh, and combinations of, uh, of them and so on. So, so what does this mean more, more concretely? So uh, deductive or objectivist is another term you will find this uh, by. Approach to research is the traditional form of research or what you might recognize as the scientific method for empirical science. By the way, let me just turn the thermostat down because I'm burning up over there. Is it just hot or is it very hot? <laughs> Maybe it's the lights. All right, I'm back. So, scientific method. This is the kind of thing that you probably have all learned about in school at some point when you were little. Right, you know, this is the kind of thing that biologists and physicists and chemists and, you know, so sort of the traditional natural science people, uh, you know, so scientific method, they follow in those disciplines. So, uh, you know, the assumption here is so some assumptions here are that one, there's some reality uh, that's external, and there's some world that exists independent of the researcher. This is really important. There's some world that exists out there. Um, and it can be understood by collecting objective data uh, about that reality, uh, hence the name objectivist. And the way we build knowledge, you know, this is your approach to research, the way we build knowledge is by developing this increasingly more refined, better understanding of uh, the causal workings of this external uh, objective world out there. So, you know, this is why, I don't know, they were uh, throwing down apple trees to see, you know, to test the laws of gravity and, and things like this. Uh, they were doing all of these experiments to uh, develop increasingly more accurate understandings of these causal laws of the universe. Okay. Um, so you can sort of, if you think about this a little bit, how this uh, can also be seen as a reductionist or a top-down approach, uh, because you start from these general abstractions, like the laws of gravity, say, um, and you go down to observable, measurable, testable hypotheses in some context, you know, that are um, in line with these more general abstractions. Okay? So you're sort of reducing from these laws of the universe, say, if you will, to something observable and measurable. Um, you know, typical research questions have to do with testing some cause and effect relationship uh, underpinning a phenomenon. Uh, and you know, maybe you start with some law, some theory about the universe or about your domain or what have you. You derive some hypotheses, you collect data, you test the hypothesis. Uh, and whatever you find can either falsify or support the hypothesis or maybe lead you down a path where you have to refine and extend the theory you started from, the laws you started from in the first place. Okay, so that's sort of the, that's the objectivist or deductive 
approach to research that's on one end of the spectrum. Okay, and experiments are common. At the other end of the spectrum, you have what people refer to as a subjectivist or inductive approach to research. So here, um, there is no universal objective reality that exists out there um, and is you know, measurable and so on. There is no such thing. Reality is instead a social construct. It only uh, exists because individuals and social groups uh, share these interpretations and understandings of reality. It does not exist outside of these uh, you know, individuals' uh, interpretations and, and them assigning meanings to this reality. It does not exist objectively uh, outside of this. So really, you know, to, as a researcher, to understand any of this, you need to explore how these people uh, assign meanings, construct meanings to this reality they, they uh, live in. So you can see, hopefully, how this is quite the opposite of the previous approach. It's, it's very constructivist in nature, it's sort of bottom-up approach rather than top-down. So you, know, you don't start from the laws of gravity, right? There is no such uh, you know, universal you know, theory or, or something like this, but you start from some specific uh, observations and some specific context, uh, and you're kind of building from the bottom up, you're building this uh, understanding, this conceptualization of the phenomena, you're building this theory, if you will. Um, right, so knowledge is subjective. Um, and you know, typically what people do is they try to collect data to get at this you know, subjective understanding from a multitude of diversity of perspectives, because that gives a richer and more nuanced understanding of the particular phenomena that they're studying. So, you know, for example, uh, if I uh, am interested in, uh, I don't know, how uh, to get students to pay attention to the instructor in class, you know, maybe, maybe it's not enough, or maybe it's a better strategy to try to, you know, study students in, in empirical methods, you know, students in program analysis, students in different departments, in different universities, in different countries, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, you know, uh, the, uh, get, Collecting data from this diversity of perspectives will give me a more complete, a richer, more nuanced understanding of uh, the phenomenon of attention in class, rather than say just the uh, students in empirical methods right now in ISO. Um, okay, uh, right, so research questions typically to explore phenomena. Uh, typical approach, we talked about this already, you, know, you start with some desire to understand the particular phenomenon, get out about it, uh, and look for patterns, emerging themes in this data to generate some, some understanding of the phenomenon. So you'll see that people use uh, things like interviews and, and observations a lot when they sort of uh, take this approach to research. This subjectivist inductive. Uh, so you know, here are the main two that we talked about: the objectivist, sort of top down, and the subject approach. Um, and this is just a summary of uh, the things we just discussed. So you know, on the one hand, you have this desire to test or falsify theories with this objectivist deductive approach, the top down one. On the other hand, you have this desire to generate, you know, some local theories that give you some understanding of. Uh, that reality that you're studying with a subjectivist inductive approach. Um, there's actually four philosophical worlds that are common. The subjectivist and objectivist, the two we talked about, are probably the most common, but there's actually another two that are also quite common. Um, one that you, a third one that we haven't talked about, it's a so-called advocate or the participatory uh, worldview of science. Uh, and this is somebody who uh, views research as a political act uh, and um, who chooses what to study based on who it will help. And there's always this so desire to inflict change in society as the outcome of that particular research. Um, but that's sort of another common and another one still is the so-called pragmatist. So this is somebody that's primarily problem-driven. Uh, 
uh, and is willing to use you know, all methods and you know, switch between worldviews at different stages of the research process, as long as it contributes to solving this problem. So it's a very pragmatic approach, problem-driven, uh, looking for practical solutions, as opposed to necessarily you know, being a sort of purist philosophically about what constitutes knowledge in the first place and what is the right way to, to do you know, research. So these are probably the, the most common four worldviews. Um, I'm curious to hear which ones, if any, is closest to your own. Could you please, uh, you know, tell me, uh, let's see, so who identifies most closely with, say, the positivist view? A raise of hand or some sort of signal telling me that you're alive over Zoom would be great. Positivists, most closely. They might not fit perfectly, but what's... Who's closest positive? There's one, two, three in the room, four in the room. Anybody on Zoom? Not too many. About four. Okay. What about the constructivist? Who thinks this is closest? Another four or so in the room and none on the Zoom call. What about sort of the participants? Sorry, or the advocate worldview. Anybody like this? Maybe a little bit. Maybe one in the room. Maybe anybody on Zoom? Interesting. So then that leaves pragmatist. What about pragmatist? Is that all the rest of you? Lots of hands on Zoom and lots of hands in class. Interesting. Yeah, this is very interesting. I guess we're all in a very, I don't know, problem oriented field in, in computer science where, yep. Is a pragmatist just like all three of the other ones? <laughs> I think so. Yeah, I think so. The best one. Okay. So we're all, all of them. I, I don't, you know, I, I would <laughs> not go as far as to um, assign value to them. Uh, I think they're all, they all have their place. They're all valid, you know, their own ways. Uh, it's, it's more about which one do you identify with? I wouldn't necessarily agree with the exact wording, but I generally agree with that because like I use empirical methods, I use interviews, I use ethnography, I've used very, very different parts on the objective versus subjective spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I you know, I think, I think I'm a pragmatist. Like, the, you know, whenever I think about this, I, I think of myself as a pragmatist and, and uh, you will see that if you look at the research that we do in my group, it's very often mixed methods, sort of you know, combining uh, you know, different methods, even within the same study, let alone over the course of you know, longer period. Uh, and also this class has a lot of mixed methods flavor, uh, as you will uh, learn. And miraculously, I can also now see the Zoom chat, which is great. I don't know what I did to deserve that, but I'll take it. <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, we talked about that. So now one more thing here. Um, obviously, you will probably have already guessed that there is also uh, often, you know, a preference for research methods that aligns with your philosophical worldviews of, of research more generally. Um, so here's one way to think about how methods themselves are related. So this spectrum say from qualitative on the one hand um, to quantitative, qualitative methods tend to be most useful when there's little prior knowledge about a particular phenomenon. Uh, you know, when you have a, a question along the lines, you know, what's going on here? You know, what is it that, I don't know, uh, these people are doing on truth social? Like what are all these people doing on the social social media platform? You know, what's going on? You know, maybe nobody has really looked at this. We don't know who they are. We don't know what they're talking about. We have no idea what's going on. You know, um, so that's when a qualitative approach would be more useful. Maybe a quantitative approach is something that you will see a lot more when uh, there's a lot of prior knowledge about a particular uh, problem or phenomenon, and maybe there's already also some particular you know solution, and you're trying precisely. Uh, assess how something is different or better or whatever than whatever was there before it. 
uh, or different from whatever was there before it. But that's sort of when you would prefer a quantitative approach. Um, so you could, uh, I guess, see that with a qualitative method, you get probably richer insights into the particular phenomenon that you're studying. Um, with a quantitative approach, less so because you're limited by the things you can measure, right? Which you know, are rarely all of the things that matter, if ever, right? So you know, it's uh, necessarily uh, more restricted, less rich, uh, but, but it is more precise in, in many ways. You know, it's less subjective than uh, uh, qualitative methods might be. Um, it's going to be fun to think about this. So towards the end of the semester and some of the last few lectures, we are uh, going to talk about some examples of controversial, dramatic, published research papers um, that will question probably this assumption a, a little bit. But I'll, I'll save that for you know later in the semester. We'll see how um, you know really, even though you would think that if you're following some sort of quantitative approach to research, uh, and there's always data and measurements and you know, some analysis of, of that data and those measurements, that the conclusions one draws from any particular study are um, uh, never controversial, right? There, are sort of, there can be only one interpretation of whatever you know, uh, findings the numbers point to. That is, interestingly, not the case at all. Uh, you'll see how you know we will probably look at the same numbers and conclude very different things, even us in this room, um, uh, because you know it's ultimately a human researcher that does this subjective final step of interpreting the you know numbers they are measuring and seeing. Uh, so no matter how objective and, and uh, precise your uh, analysis is, it's still down to the human interpretation at the end. Um, okay, but but in general, in general, there's less of that uh, with quantitative research than with uh, qualitative. So I think the, the point holds uh, by and large. Um, okay, so yeah, I, I've already talked about this a little bit. You will probably agree with me by the end that it is often most effective in terms of the confidence that you can have about the phenomenon you're studying or the strength of the claims that you are making, uh, it's probably often most effective to use methods in combination. Uh, you know, it could be in sequence, it could be in parallel. We'll talk a lot more about kind of, you know, designs for mixed methods studies, um, but often uh, it's useful to, uh, to do both uh, as part of you know, any individual uh, study. So I guess back to a point that Trent was making on Zoom earlier uh, in, the, in the lecture about you know, how the evaluation, I, I hinted at you know, it, on the numerical, you know, that's, that's probably uh, not the most effective way to, to design an evaluation that's sort of solely focused on, on numbers. Uh, okay, so here's a bunch of very common used research methods and where they sit on the spectrum, um, you know, ranging from things like uh, observation and ethnographies as probably the most uh, qualitative approaches to something like true randomized experiments with participants randomly assigned to conditions in treatments and so on, um, as probably the most commonly encountered into purely quantitative uh, research. And, and things in between like you know, interviews and surveys and exploratory data analysis and classroom <laughs> experiments um, and, and, and uh, uh, causal inference methods from observational data, things that sit in between. Uh, let me show you a few examples. So here is uh, part of the abstract of a paper. I, I wanna illustrate a little bit kind of how these methods are useful for answering for fundamentally different kinds of research questions. And, and you know, hopefully it will give you this intuition that there really is this natural mapping between problem or research question and the kinds of methods that are most useful at your disposal. So this is a study um, of surgical teams and so communication and relationship dynamics 
between people uh, in the operating room uh, as part of surgical teams. Uh, and it is an ethnography. So here uh, you know, they talk about how uh, health professionals and surgical teams are highly interdependent. They work under time pressure. Uh, and it is of particular importance that this teamwork functions well, uh, you know, obviously. Um, and even though extensive research has been carried out regarding relational coordination in many contexts, including surgery, no study has explored how relational coordination works at the micro level. Um, and the purpose of this study was to explore all of those things. Um, and the researchers conducted an ethnography uh, which involved observing participants in 39 surgical teams. Uh, they conducted semi-structured interviews. They observed people over 10 months um, and uh, you know, across multiple operating units in some hospital, et cetera, et cetera. So what do you see, uh, what stands out to you uh, here? If we talk about, uh, if you think about you know, the state of knowledge or the particular research question that this paper addresses, and their choice of the uh, 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 ethnography, which is this sort of observation of participants. What stands out uh, uh, here? Well, what is the kind of question? What is it that the researchers are trying to, to do here? Where are we on the spectrum of um, uh, knowledge about the particular phenomenon? How much do we know about nation in these surgical teams? Yes, I see a hand in, in class. Seems like limited prior knowledge, more qualitative. Right. So you know, we know we know a lot about this coordination or communication or dynamics in other contexts, but we have no information, no knowledge about how those play out in this particular context. You know, and I'm sure the paper will go into more details uh, about you know, how uh, we can maybe expect that this particular context is different from all the other ones that have been studied in the past you know, in some ways that change these dynamics, right? Yep. Um, this just stands out to me and this is common with like, Ethnography is another types of very qualitative studies, but it's based on a social science theory. So they're investigating through some sort of framework. Um, yeah. Yeah, great. Okay, so that's that's interesting you would mention this. Thank you. Uh, we'll talk more about theory later on. That's interesting. You know, we talked a little bit about how you uh, maybe prefer qualitative research methods early uh, with there's little knowledge about a particular phenomenon. And maybe the goal of these studies is to build this theory, right? So it sounds like here, we're a little bit you know, further uh, to the right on this kind of knowledge spectrum. Like there is you know, already some established theory perhaps about you know, how uh, this particular, uh, what is it? Relationship, uh, relational coordination. You know, there's, there's this theory and maybe it has been tested in other domains and other contexts. We just don't know if it holds in this particular one as well. You know, maybe this one is sort of interestingly different from the other ones that have been already tested. Uh, and you know, it's worthwhile to, to test it further here, right? Uh, and it's also interesting that you know, typically when we talked about testing theory and testing hypotheses, you you know think of numbers and experiments and things like that. You know, testing the laws of gravity. Uh, that's not the case at all here either. Right? So you can sort of see this murky, you know, um, mapping between you know research methods and research questions. Right? It's, it's not a, not always a one to one thing where there's only one right answer uh, in a particular context. It always uh, always depends. Um, okay. So little knowledge about the, this phenomenon in this context. And the researchers, you know, so they didn't really have hypotheses that they could maybe test numerically, right? Because they just didn't know enough about how this phenomenon manifests at all in this particular context, right? So they chose this observation method, right? To build this understanding of the phenomenon in the first place. Uh, and, you know, look how much work this was. They, you know, followed people around for 10 months and did all kinds of data collection 
uh, on top of just observing them, right? Uh, in, you know, in their environment, right? So ethnography means observing the people and their environment. Uh, you're a fly on the wall and you take notes and you, just, you know, sit with them for 10 months. Uh, but also, you know, you collect all kinds of additional data through these interviews from them, you know, before, after, during, a, you know, could, could be anything. Okay, so that was an ethnography. Uh, here's another one closer to, to computer science. Um, you, you know, you might, I think, okay, fine. So ethnographies are, why do I care about ethnographies? They only happen in the social sciences. Well, no, they, you know, can happen anywhere. Here's an example where they happen in you know, programming languages research or software engineering research, if you will. Um, this was an ethnography of copy and paste programming practices. Okay. So I'll read you part of the abstract here. Although programmers frequently copy and paste code when they develop software, implications of common copy and paste usage patterns have not been studied previously. We've conducted an ethnography to understand their copy and paste practices and discover opportunities to assist uh, copy and paste usage patterns. We observed people using an instrumented IDE and then analyzed why and how they use copy and paste operations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, there's this maybe, uh, I don't know, um, anecdote or observation that people copy paste code a lot. This is a long, by the way, it's an old paper. Uh, I don't know if I can see, uh, yeah, I don't have the, uh, I don't have the year this was published. So, you know, back when this paper came out, uh, people started noticing that programmers were copying uh, left and right, uh, but nobody knew why, you know, why is it that they're doing this, you know, and for what purpose and how are they doing this? You know, is there anything that we should uh, worry about? And, you know, is there anything that we could do to help them in this process of copying and pasting? Or, uh, or maybe this is just that's something they're doing for some other 2004 says Nemo on Zoom. Thanks. Yeah, so quite a while ago. Um, okay. Uh, so, you know, you can see anographies, they can be rich. Uh, you have to immerse yourself in the environment and you tend to, uh, you try to see the world through the eyes of your uh, participants. Uh, the kinds of questions that you answer are you know, uh, this type you know, how do people think about their work? What are they facing? Um, what are the things that make ethnographies rigorous? Well, one common pitfall with these is that, uh, and by the way, there are some super interesting anecdotes. I'll try to dig some up uh, and share them later. Of ethnographers that were studying, I don't know, ind indigenous populations or things like this. And they went to live off with, with these people for uh, a while. Um, and they, you know, they had, so had this preconceived story that they wanted to tell. Uh, and they you know, ended up very famously uh, making all kinds of inferences that were, were simply not true. Uh, so, you know, the researcher was sort of you know, seeing things that weren't really there. So you know, one thing that is uh, hard with ethnographies, and things, and one thing that is needed to make it rigorous, is constantly testing these interpretations that you as a researcher are, are drawing. Because remember, you're you know, sitting there in the back, creepily observing you know, everyone as they're, I don't know, uh, attending class or what, what have you, right? And taking notes and then you're drawing conclusions and you're interpreting all of these observations that you've written down, right? Making inferences about, you know, why the students are paying or not attention uh, in, in empirical method, right? And, uh, you know, may, maybe uh, the, the conclusions you're drawing have nothing to do with reality. So it's really important to constantly test these interpretations and triangulate uh, with multiple sources of data when possible. Um, okay, yeah, so one thing here worth noting, typically you can only do ethnographies on, on a small scale, right? You know, there's only so many uh, people you can immerse yourself with uh, at, at any point in time, and there's only so long you can observe them for, it's just not practical to the scale. Um, and there's also really no way to um, you know, make causal claims with with a method like this. It's a very subjective. Uh, there could be all kinds of other confounding factors that uh, are hard to isolate when you're doing this. Um, okay. Here is another method still, different example uh, altogether. This is a paper uh, 2012, so it's exactly 10 years old. It's a paper that first studied programmers using the GitHub platform. 
when we think about you know GitHub these days, everybody has heard of it. It's just so very you know, boring and common and frequently used in, in software engineering uh, and beyond. Back then, it was this new cool thing that had just happened, and really nobody knew what it was about and uh, how it was different, if at all. So. Let me read you this uh, excerpt. Social applications on the web let users track and follow the activities of a large number of others, regarding, regardless of location or affiliation. There's a potential for this transparency to radically improve collaboration and learning in complex knowledge-based activities. So there's a new way that people are working with this high degree of transparency, and it has a potential to change things that we knew about you know, how people are working. Okay. Uh, then based on a series of in-depth interviews uh, with central and peripheral GitHub users, we examined the value of transparency for large-scale distributed collaborations and communities of practice. So um, there's some new thing that is arguably, right? they go through the step that's important is arguably different from the things that existed before, right? Because if there's a new thing that is arguably the same as things that have existed before that we understand well, you know, there's probably little value in further studying it. Okay, so this is important. There's, argu there's a new thing, it's arguably different. And we go about interviewing a diverse sample of users of this new thing, okay? So in this case, both central and peripheral, right, by design, to see how they are using this new thing and why and so on, what kinds of things they do with this, and, you know, and then reason about how it's all different. Okay. So, you know, we we're talking earlier about this, getting this diversity of perspectives. That's important here too, right? Because maybe, you know, maybe, so why study, say, two groups? Why study central and peripheral users you know, at the same time? Because maybe they have a very different use of the platform, right? Maybe they do very different things, right? You have this reason to, to expect that they might behave differently. They might do things differently, right? So you explicitly study both subgroups to try to discover those differences, right? Expect might be there okay, by design. Um, okay, so interviews. Right, so what's an interview is just a structured form of interaction. You, know, you the researcher, uh, typically asks a bunch of questions of your informants. They give you answers to those questions. You can follow up and you can probe them further. You, know, you can ask them for more details about you know, any particular thing they've mentioned. This is, so typically there's some structure, but there's also some uh, freedom in sort of how you steer the, uh, the discussion with these people. And you also collect all of this the data and information from this diverse set of uh, uh, informants. Okay, um, about perceptions, about opinions, uh, processed observations. So, so, you know, about things that they say they do, okay, which doesn't always mean that it's what they actually do. We we'll talk a lot more about this at some point in the class soon. Right, the things that people tell you they do may be very different from the things they actually do when they're not ashamed to you know, admit it in public to tell you about it. Uh, so that's a well-known thing. Um, and you, know, you, can, you can ask questions about how things are done and uh, what are exceptions and what are problems and so on. Um, what makes it rigorous? Uh, well thought out instrument and, and preparation on your part well thought out topics, questions that uh, don't bias the uh, respondents you know, towards particular answers, cross-validation in questions, uh, checking your interpretation, et cetera. Okay, yeah, so, you know, famous limitation, we talked about this a little bit, the information you collect through interviews is always filtered right, by the, you know, informants that are giving you this information, right? It's not something that you observe firsthand. It's only something, you know, filtered through their perceptions and experience and whatever, you know, it might be. It's always filtered. The view you get is always filtered. Okay. Here's another one still. 
Um, this is a study that looked at uh, work from home practices uh, within Microsoft. But let me read you this part from the uh, abstract that's relevant here. We use a particular statistical technique, a causal identification strategy commonly used in the social sciences to control for unobserved confounding factors. And we estimate the causal effect of working from home on whatever, some measures of productivity. Uh, our analysis relies on measuring the difference in changes between those who worked from home compared to the pandemic, sending everybody, you know, forcing everybody to work from home, and those uh, who did not. Okay. So what does this sound like? I like uh, the fourth one on your spectrum, which is like quasi experiments, like using causal methods that aren't, aren't actual experiments. Yeah, right. So, yeah, a true experiment here would be you know, I randomly assign each and every one of you to attend class in person or to join class remotely. And, you know, maybe I have, and, and then I test. You know which ones of you or which group on average scores higher you know on, their, on your final grades right depending on whether you attended in person or remotely right there's none of that here right they did not randomly assign their engineers at microsoft to work from home or not right they you know everybody was forced to work from home when the plague hit okay so that was sort of an, uh, this natural intervention that had occurred but they had this you know, trick, right? They had access to another set of engineers that had chosen to work from home previously. Okay, so they, they could compare, you know, sort of activity, behavior and whatnot uh, between these two groups, people that chose to work from home due to the pandemic and the people that were forced to work from home because of the pandemic. Okay, and they could try to isolate the effect of the pandemic from the general effects of working from home. Does that make sense? Right, so this is an example of, you know, how you're trying to get at this causal claim, this causal relationship. You want to isolate the effect of working from home or the effect of the pandemic or both. Uh, you want to make claims about those, but you don't have random assignment in a true experiment. Okay, so it's sort of, you know, what's the next best thing you could do, uh, right? And this is a design that will allow you to do this, and we'll talk a lot more about sort of how this works um, later on. Um, okay, so we, we talked about this. Yeah. I was going to ask, what, what, what would you say would make it more rich than a uh, true experiment? Because, you know, a true experiment has the smallest rich. <laughs> Uh, on the rich, precise scale that you have there. Um, Would it be that there's like unexpected variables that you're not accounting for in an experiment versus? Yeah, so may maybe, maybe, I don't know. So I, you know, now that you ask, I would be tempted to th think of them as similarly rich. Um, I don't know that I, would necessarily argue that quasi experiments are richer than experiments, uh, even though I drew them like that on that diagram previously. But I don't know that I believe that myself now. Sam? I may be misunderstanding the meaning of the word rich, but my interpretation of that was that, like with a quasi experiment, there's so many more things that you can study and questions you can ask than you can with a true experiment. Like, there are lots of things that you that we would like to know about that we could, would never do a true experiment on because it would be wildly unethical that you can ask questions about in a quasi experiment. So maybe like maybe the level of richness within a particular question that you ask is the same, but there are more questions that you can ask. Yeah, I agree with that. So. Was that audible on the on the call? That was a good point. Okay. And so here's the final example I want to show you. This is a very famous paper that made the the rounds uh, came out last year, the year before. Uh, do you remember? 2021, last year. 
a very famous paper that solved this, you know, uh, burning question that people have had for the longest time. You know, I would lose sleep over this, you know, like how uh, many citations to my papers am I going to get? Uh, or how many more citations to my papers am I going to get if I tweet about them? Okay. As opposed to if I don't, right? And there have been lots of studies uh, prior to this one using observational methods. So uh, looking for correlations between tweeting and citation counts. That previously this paper never been a true experiment to test this. And this is the first ever that I uh, know of, first ever true experiment that tried to answer this very burning question. How many more citations uh, is your paper on average likely to get if you tweet about it? Okay, and they uh, randomly assigned papers to be tweeted via some whatever uh, account uh, or, or not. Okay, which is what you would want to have in the true experiment. And then they measured citations one year later uh, between the uh, compare citations one year later between the two groups of papers. Uh, and they found uh, tweeting results in significantly more article citations over time, blah, 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 blah. If I remember correctly, uh, it's three times more citations over the course of one year uh, on average. So this, you know, is an example of a true experiment because it has this random assignment to conditions, right? Here they randomly assigned uh, tweets to the, sorry, papers to either the tweet condition or the no tweet condition. So on average, if we think about, you know, the sets, the two sets of papers and the two conditions, they shouldn't necessarily be uh, uh, of any higher quality or more citable on average. So surely some papers within each group will be better than others, more popular, more citable, et cetera. But on average, the two groups should be indistinguishable in terms of how good the papers are because they were randomly assigned, right? So, you know, you will get uh, about as many bad papers in each group and about as many good papers in each group and so on and so forth. So really, you know, when you compare then citations one year later, you can be very confident that it is due to this treatment of, you know, tweeting about the papers. Uh, is that true? Small sample. Is that true? Do you believe this argument? I mean, in, ge in general, in general, you know, experiments are the gold standard for science. So this is true in general, but is, you know, is it, do you believe it in this case? Anybody willing to question this? Uh, yeah, I would question how uh, generalizable it is given the sample size and sampling method. So let, let's say this, let's say the sample was large enough and the two groups were large enough. Um, let, let's say that is not a concern here. Um, that's a good point. It could be, it could be, that's always the case. Like, it could be that they didn't have enough power to you know, make these claims. Um, so I agree, I take the point. So that's one, one uh, scenario in which you know, maybe you want to be skeptical. What's at least another one? Um, it seems, I'm assuming this might be just specifically within the medical community or maybe even a subfield within the medical community. And so I don't know if this would necessarily translate to like theory, theoretical CS papers or um, things like that. So I think it's also dependent on the community that you're studying as well. Okay. Um, can you elaborate a bit? How, why would that matter? Why would the community matter? Um, I think that each community might have a different set of practices. So just speaking anecdotally, for instance, like I know for a lot of like ML research, it's really, really common to promote your papers, let's say on Twitter, gotcha. but like software engineers might use blogs or. Yeah. Okay. So it's about the size of the effect. So you don't, you don't necessarily question the presence of the effect, but you're maybe thinking about the size of the effect. Right. You know, maybe in ML, uh, people are on Twitter a lot more. So, you know, maybe it's not 3x, maybe it's 300x, you know, the, the increase in citations over a year. Right, so I absolutely agree with this as well. Anything else that you could think of? What would one other thing be that would you know, cause you to question this? Like one, one thing to me that is somewhat questionable is, you know, they, usually with an experiment, you apply the treatment 
and measure the outcome right away. All right, so here, you know, you've applied the treatment, the tweet, but you measure the outcome only one year later. So that suggests to me that, you know, we don't know what happened, you know, what other things happened during this period of one, one year, um, you know, that maybe affected more of the one group than the other, you know, could that be? That you have to give it time to be cited. So I don't see how you could not measure it. I mean, because it's hard to get proximate causation, but yeah. Like, yeah. So see, so I guess you know, one thing I'm hoping you will conclude from this is that it is actually you know, it, it's always hard to do experiments, but it's particularly hard to do experiments, you know, in some contexts for some questions when you can't actually. You know, uh, when it's expensive or impractical to manipulate uh, the treatment, the intervention, when you don't have access to people, when it would take too long for the effect to manifest itself, when, it, you know, there's all kinds of uh, scenarios where it's just not possible as much as you would like to, it's not possible to run experiments. Why, for example, the field of econometrics exists and, you know, all of these attempts to uh, draw close to causal claims from observational data because that's usually a lot more accessible and easy to obtain. Um, but yeah, so look, even for something as simple as this, looking at the effects of tweets, you still have to wait, you know, a year for it to play out. And you know, maybe there's other things that could have happened in the meantime that um, make you question the effect. So it's really complicated to do this well. Um, okay, so talked about this too. Uh, Right, so uh, I guess I hope that you believe me more now when I say that, you know, really all of these methods um, are limited. I, flawed is the wrong word. You know, limited is the word, I think, a better word. But they're, they're limited in you know, the kinds of claims that they can support, right? fundamentally limited. But, but the, the great news, I think, for all of us um, is that they are typically differently limited. So really, you know, that I'm, I'm preaching this mixed methods approach to uh, research uh, that tries to overcome limitations of one method by, you know, applying uh, cleverly a uh, different complement method that does not suffer from the same limitations uh, to uh, get, uh, increase your level of confidence. Um, okay, so, this course is about everything we just discussed. Um, we uh, meet twice a week, uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays at this time. Uh, if the internet works out, we will continue to do this uh, in hybrid mode throughout the semester. Um, I will be here every class in person and I, I invite you to join me here as well, um, just so we don't depend on the internet as much. But some of you are remote and it's totally fine to continue to do that. Uh, and I will continue live streaming lectures uh, throughout the semester. Um, I have added you all to Canvas. We'll use Canvas for managing assignments and I think also for communication. Uh, it's, it's easy enough for me to send you messages to Canvas that you all get. Uh, and I don't have to keep track of you know, who's in the class and, and whatnot. No. Otherwise, um, we don't have assigned office hours that occur regularly, but we have a wonderful TA. Do you want to introduce yourself, Richie Bobo? Sure. Hello, hello everyone. Also, I probably come here because yeah, I want to introduce yeah. to the people over here. But the camera is over there. Oh. <laughs> hello, hello everyone. Uh, I I'm humble. I am uh, right. I'm a fourth year PhD student in societal computing program. Uh, actually, Bob is my advisor. And I have taken this class before during the pandemic, and I'm just very glad to be a TA and you can uh, ask me any kind of these questions. I can guarantee you I will always know the answer right away, but I will try my best to make sure I get the answer um, uh, if you find me. And if you have any questions, you can use uh, email or Slack. I know many of you are from my side. You can use Slack or not on my door whatever ways um, and um, just uh, like
try to reach out to me if you have something. For like complaints about grading. Oh yeah, sure. Thanks a lot, sure. glad to have you. Thank you. All right, um, so um, we are happy to meet with you anytime about anything, uh, you know, just reach out to us uh, remotely or in person. The, there is a class website, which uh, you will find at this address. That's where I post all of the slides. Um, I would also like to post the video recordings of these lectures, and I will ask for your permission to be in the video. I'll send out an email afterwards, uh, or for your preference not to be, in which case I will just edit you out if you happen to be in the video. But that's totally fine. Um, but anyway, you'll find all the slides and pointers to readings on the class website. So I'm not gonna copy all of those to Canvas. I'll, I'll just keep them in one place. So please refer to the website for reading materials. Um, I'll use Canvas primarily for assignments and discussions uh, and grading, uh, but everything else is gonna be on the website. Um, yeah, so you know, hopefully we've learned by now that uh, you know, we're here for each other uh, and we're gonna treat each other as Okay. humans first and foremost uh you know more than anything else um okay so this is seminar style primarily uh, so that means most of the work will happen outside of class um, um there will be a lot for you to read um and we will think about ways to further incentivize you to actually do the readings maybe we'll have quizzes every you know every class Kind of make sure that you've read the, the stuff that we were hoping you would read and things like that. Um, typically, we'll come to class and I will do my best to teach you about the you know rigorous application of inner works inner workings of any particular research method, um, and we will also dissect as a group uh, examples of research papers that apply those uh, different methods. Uh, so this way you see kind of the, the theory and practice of, of any research method. Um, typical class will be, you know, a mixture of discussing the you know, methodological aspects of a method, uh, talking about the readings, um, having some hands-on practice sometimes, you know, I might ask you to, you know, workshop in class, uh, I don't know, questions for an interview protocol or things like this. Uh, we'll have a bunch of activities. Uh, in class um, and there will be a sign up sheet we'll send this around uh, i expect that each of you will present at least one of these research papers that we will dissect as a group uh, at some point during the semester uh, you know, we have a list of research papers you can sign up to present uh, i expect at least everyone uh, possibly more than one some people i'm not sure exactly how many uh, papers we'll have yet um, but this is part of the, the experience. So that means you will present, sorry, you will prepare some 10 minute presentation summarizing the particular paper you know, uh, to the rest of us. Uh, and you will also offer uh, some first thoughts kind of critiquing that paper. You know, what are the strong parts of uh, the study? What are the weak parts of the study? And we'll all kind of talk about uh, those and uh, see what else we come up with. There's two sets of homework assignments. The major homework assignment, the, the most important one, is a mixed methods research project that you have to do by the end of the semester. Uh, it has to use, you know, at least two, that's why the mixed methods, at least two empirical components, methods that we will have covered in this class or it's okay if we haven't, you know, you, you could, if you want to use something else that we don't cover in class, you know, just talk to me, I'm, I'm open-minded. Uh, but but uh, the idea is that uh, you will, you know, think a little bit starting now about what your projects might be. Uh, and we'll have short kickoff presentations in about a month or so. Um, and th that's when you will tell us us what your research question or questions are uh, and kind of how you're thinking about answering them what's the overview uh, of the study design and the methodology you know what kinds of data are you thinking of collecting how might you go by doing it how might you analyze the data you're collecting things like this basically a plan right a very short five minute kickoff presentation detailing your plan for how to uh, to do this 
Uh, and there's going to be a final report at the end of the semester that looks like a paper. So that means, you know, there's a thorough lit review. Uh, there's a discussion of you know, your research questions, an overview of your methodology, um, description of your methods, et cetera, uh, you know, results, discussion of results, things like this. Okay, so something that looks like a technical research paper uh, in, in uh, you know, in, in your field, and most of you are computer science students, uh, but something that looks like a research paper. So that's sort of the, the big, uh, the elephant in the room, that's the big project. Um, things that are different this time around compared to 2021 when we last had this class. One is that um, after consulting with Bobo, I have him to thank for this, he insisted that the project be mixed methods. Uh, previously, we uh, it was possible for students to you know choose uh, you know their favorite research method and you know, apply that for their project. Uh, this year, uh, we are insisting that it be mixed methods because one thing, and I agreed with him. One thing we noticed is that you know you tend to default to the methods you're most comfortable with and don't get as much practice with the methods you're less comfortable with, and I want to give you more practice this way. So I'm forcing you to you know, also use a method you're less comfortable with to practice some more. Um, obviously, I, I realize that this is a lot. So uh, I don't expect that this will you know, be entirely complete. That, that will be OK. So, uh, but uh, you know, for example, at least one of the parts of the study should probably be you know, relatively complete, even if the other is, is more preliminary. Uh, uh, but you know, it has to be mixed methods. The other thing that is different, well, I guess no, that, that is the one big thing that is different is that projects have to be mixed methods. Now, the probably saving grace is that the way this class is designed uh, is to uh, be most relevant and useful for your actual research. Uh, I believe you're all graduate students somewhere. So that means you're already doing research somewhere. Um, so what I would like, ideally, what I would like you to do is use this class as an excuse and opportunity to improve, hopefully, on your current research projects. So you can recycle stuff that you're doing anyway by design. I am encouraging you to do this. But it has to be stuff that you haven't already done. So you can't serve me a paper that you've done you know, last semester and call that the report for class, right? So I want this to be something where I, where I can help you, you know, design it, have some impact on the outcome rather than something that's already happened, uh, is in a shelf somewhere or is already published, right? So it has to be something that you're doing now or you're starting to do now uh, that I you know, can help with, that we can help with. Um, rather than something you've done already. Uh, but it's totally okay for you to recycle, and I hope you will, I hope you will recycle stuff that you're doing anyway. If you're not planning to recycle stuff that you're doing anyway, that's also totally okay. We have all kinds of ideas for things you could do interesting projects on. Um, and we're kind of running short of time now, so I, I will come back to this later. We can talk more offline as well. Uh, but there's all kinds of existing data sets that you could use as starting points. There's actually one that's particularly interesting. It's part of the Mining Software Repositories conference, where there is a public challenge data set that is currently uh, available with the expectation that people who analyze and, and do something interesting with this data set actually submit a paper to the conference by February 5, uh, and hopefully get that paper published and go to Melbourne, Australia to present their work. Um, on your advisor's expense, not mine. <laughs> um, but so uh, because now the class is taught in the fall as opposed to usually spring in the past, we're actually aligning really well with the timeline for the MSR challenge. So, you know, if, if you know, maybe this is something that's interesting to you and, you know, maybe your current research project um, is, is too far for work well for this class or whatever, you know, maybe you want to have a second side project to keep you uh, entertained. It's totally fine. And I encourage you to look at this. Uh, and we have all kinds of other data sets that uh, or you know, ideas of projects that would be interesting, could lead to publications. Uh, 
even if they're not necessarily uh, the things you're currently working on anyway. So that's also totally fine. Just you know, talk to us uh, about this. Okay, all right. Um, the other, so th this is the big thing. The, this will be worth uh, half the grade, the final project, uh, including the presentations, the kickoff and final presentations. That's half the grade. The other half the grade is we'll have a bunch of occasional small assignments. For example, uh, today uh, for Thursday, I will ask you to skim, not to read carefully, just skim two papers and think about how their study designs compare and what kinds of uh, methods do each paper, uh, does each paper use? And kind of why did they do that? So, and I'll ask you to uh, discuss this on Canvas for Thursday, just a, a brief you know, uh, comments on, on a discussion thread on Canvas. And there'll be other small assignments throughout. You know, we'll ask you to um, uh, design a, a cohere at some point. We'll ask you to uh, run some regression model on some given data set at some point. You know, relatively small things that would, uh, you could do from one week to the next with hopefully not too much effort. Uh, that is the other, uh, that's together with participation in class. You know, these presentations of, of existing papers that you will be doing uh, that's the other half of the grade. Uh, okay, yes, that's, I talked about this. Uh, and yeah, so I think, I think let me stop here because we're uh, running a little over um, and see if there's any questions on content or format that I can answer now. And otherwise, I'm happy to take more offline or pick up on, uh, on Thursday. <laughs>